Hello and welcome to another C++ tutorial. So this time around we are going to be taking a look at the concept of inheritance. So inheritance is a fundamental tool that really what it allows us to do is write less code and write simpler code and make it easier for us to be able to extend and add things to our games or to our projects. And that's a, the really a big advantage of it. It lets us you know, have that less, lesser amount of code and also extend things more readily. Now in terms of what inheritance is, it is a, a topic that can be a little tricky to understand until we sort of work with it. Uh, but if we think about in a game, so say we've got a game where we have a bunch of different types of animals in it. We might have dogs, cats, fish, you know, birds, a lot of different things there. If we don't use inheritance, then we set up all of those different classes, then that means that anywhere in the code where we want to do something with every animal, we would need to loop over all of the dogs, then all of the cats, all of the fish, all of the birds. We have to maintain all of these separate things. And that means the workload for adding in a new animal type is significant. And so that's really sort of not a, not a great setup. There'd also be a lot of common information on those animals. You know, they're all going to have visual representations. They're all going to be able to move, to make sounds. There's a lot of common setup there. So it's very easy for us to have to write lots and lots of code if we don't use inheritance. So inheritance allows us to avoid doing this. So let's see how we actually go about doing that. So what I'm actually going to do to begin with is I am actually going to set up essentially the bad version of this and then we'll see how we can bring that into using inheritance to simplify things. Uh, the reason I'm wanting to show it this way is because setting up essentially the bad version is what we're likely to be more familiar with and is a very easy point to uh, set things up from and it lets us then go through a bit of the thought process of how do we decide to set up inheritance and how do we decide what things need to be common. So to begin with, I am actually going to go and create a few classes. So I am going to create our dog class. I'm also going to create our cat class. And then, for good measure, I will chuck in a fish and a bird one. Just so we've got enough ones that have sort of a variety of what they're needing to do. So, final one. So, there we go. We've got all of our classes set up. I want our main program here to have access to those. So I'm just going to include all of the different ones just so that we have them available. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is I kind of intentionally am including everything uh, going in alphabetical order. Usually with C++ we do end up often with a lot of includes, so having them a bit organized is kind of a good approach. So. As I was saying, if we wanted to do something with all of these, so if I set up a vector, and I'm just going to create a whole bunch of these different animals, but what I would end up having to do, say I wanted to create you know, a few different birds, cats, dogs, fish, what I would end up having is I would have all birds. I would then end up having a similar thing for with cats. And I won't actually set up all of the other ones, uh, but this sort of illustrates the, the fundamental problem there. Uh, and if I set up in these, let's give these a function. Uh, so we'll give them a public function uh, that is something that basically, uh, you know, uh, is their uh, entry call, uh, something when they appear in the, the sort of scene. Uh, 
So the form up here. So I can set this up. So I've got this for the each of the particular ones. So I'm going to bring that over to all of them. Now in this case, I'm creating these all at the same time. I'm making sure they're the same name. But you can imagine it would be very, very easy in a project if this was something where, okay, we created a base set you know, six months ago. Now we go to add one in. It'd be very easy to get the naming of these things inconsistent. Again, that creates extra overhead uh, there, which is less than ideal. Uh, I'm just going to create the implementations of all of these. So we can use the little helpers in Visual Studio, makes it just a little bit quicker for setting that up for ourselves. And we'll just do the same one for this. Let everything be saved. We can close all of these. So, okay, they have that perform appear, and I'll actually load up our source files so we can have them do something. So what I will do is bring in uh, IO stream just so we can output something onto the screen. Just have a little bit of stuff get output for each one of these. Uh, and we'll see what that ends up looking like. And so this thing where we've got a function that it performs the same purpose in all of these ones, where there is a, a similarity in behavior, where there is a similarity potentially in data that we would have, uh, that's usually our signal for we should be considering using inheritance. So common functions, common uh, data is usually what I'm looking for uh, when I'm sort of setting this up. Now early on, it's okay if you're not spotting those, in particular if you're diving into the language very early on, you're very new to it. It's okay to write the long version like this. And then when we spot that the, that similarity is there, we come back later and we can bring in inheritance, we can refactor the code to be uh, more you know, simpler and to set it up so it's going to be easier to maintain. That's something I really encourage is don't be afraid to go and refactor your code to improve the quality of it. You know, obviously it's something where you want to you know, balance when you're actually doing that, but that can be a really valuable thing to improve the quality of the code particular if it's going to make it easier to maintain and add things in future, that's really, really valuable to be doing that. So what I can now do here, uh, is I can go and say, okay, well, bird, perform up here. That needs to be that. And I could do the exact same thing or the cats. But as was said, this would be really annoying if I had to be doing this every single new type of animal and add. Uh, that rapidly ends up being a huge amount of code. And that's not good. We want to avoid doing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an animal class. That animal class will be our parent or base class for each of these different types of animals. And our parent can then store common information and it can also store and have common logic. So if we have logic that doesn't need to be different between the different animals, it just sits on the parent class. And then the animals, the individual child ones, if they need to, can actually modify that. We'll have a bit of a look at how we can do that as well. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to set up our animal class. I'm 
Now this, I want everything to inherit from that. So that's the first step of what I'm going to do is make it so everything inherits from it. How I do that? Well, firstly, the general setup that you'll see is I would write like of that. But you'll notice it's grumpy at me because it doesn't know what animal is. So this is a case where what I need to do is I need to include animal. So for us to be able to inherit from something, it needs to know what that particular thing is. So we need to actually have that included. So I need to do this for each of our particular animals. Every case, I can do that. Just bring that in for all of them. And I need to make sure I put public. Uh, that does actually have specific meaning in C++. Public is generally what we're going to use in most cases, uh, but it does have a specific meaning. So it is important to make sure that we're remembering that. Uh, and it controls what functions and variables get brought across, but it's pretty rare that we're needing to use anything other than public. So, okay, good so far. I've set up this concept. It's, you know, the code now runs. But what I want to be able to get to be doing here is I want to actually have a standard vector of animals, all animals, and then I want to be able to just have one loop here where it's doing like of this. That's what I want to be able to do. And this is what inheritance will eventually allow me to do once I make a few further updates. This will actually make it possible for me to easily add in a new animal and the code here doesn't change. That's the great advantage we get with inheritance. I write this and I could now add in 500 different animals and they could all have the same perform the, the performer here implemented and the code here doesn't need to change. I focus on implementing the logic for the particular animals I'm adding not on going and updating and maintaining existing code because the existing code by using inheritance has been designed in a way that it's nice and flexible. This is the major advantage we get with inheritance. As I said, it lets us write simpler code, and it lets us write less code. And less code is always better. Simpler code is always better. The smaller the amount of code we have, the less potential for bugs. The simpler the code is, the easier it is for someone to go in and update it and maintain it, the easier it is to spot potential issues in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a few different animals here. So we're going to just do a pushback and I'm just going to add in one of each. All animals just have one of each one. And then what we'll do is we'll fix up so that the performer peer uh, is able to work. Those there. So the error we'll be getting here is one we'd expect, saying that animal doesn't have a performer peer, which it doesn't. So let's give it one. So we can set up our particular class and then we can do our setup for creating the uh, implementation of it. And we'll bring that up. We need to include IO stream output a message. And in this case, we expect the individual animals off of this to have implemented it. So I'm actually going to make the message indicate kind of more that this is a, that a problem has happened. Uh, 
just have that just so we can see an error message if it's output the incorrect one. So let's run this. What we would be hoping to see is the things indicating that they're a bird, cat, dog, fish. But is that what we're actually going to see? If you have worked with classes in C Sharp, then you probably have a bit of an idea of what we might be about to see. So let's run this. And it's going to need to compile the ones, and then we'll see. Every single one says it's the animal class. So, okay. Again, if you've come from C Sharp, what you would then be expecting is, okay, this, this, this function perform appear. When it's running it here, it's looping over a set of animals. And we've done nothing to tell it that this particular function, the cat or the bird or the dog, is wanting to actually customize it or do anything different with it. So that's something that we do need to do. When we're doing inheritance, it's not an automatic thing that every function can just be overridden by the children. We have to actually explicitly say this function can be overridden. So what I would do is I would say virtual here. So when we mark a function as virtual, what we're saying is when you go to run this function, figure out which particular actual class this is running on. Is it actually an animal or is it one of these child classes? So these ones we need to indicate also that they are able to be overridden. So we've added in in the parent class indicating that this function is virtual so that it needs to be when it, when it goes to run it, that it should be trying to do a bit of extra work to figure out what particular one to run. What we also need to do is in the child classes, we do virtual and we also do override. Now, override is a slightly newer keyword in C++. Uh, by indicating override there, it's going to mean that if, for example, this function didn't exist in the parent class, we'd actually get an error. So it gives us a bit of a better uh, error checking, which is good. So I'm just going to put virtual and override in each of these. This is fairly similar to what we would be doing in C sharp. And again, if we were in C sharp right now, I would expect this to fully work. So if we now go to run this, we're actually still seeing the base class, which if this was in C sharp, we wouldn't. C++ a really important thing with how it works with inheritance and in particular with what we're doing here, which is something referred to as polymorphism. So that process of it trying to figure out what particular one it's working with. That doesn't kick in when we're working with things as a value type. In C++, polymorphism, getting that full value out of inheritance, we need to be working with things as either a pointer or a reference, which means I need to change these to all now be a pointer. Uh, references would work as well, but vectors of references, things like of that, you don't see often. They can be quite tricky for actually working with. So if I run that now, we get the correct behavior. So this is something that's really important when we're working with inheritance, and in particular, when we're wanting to uh, make use of that feature of polymorphism, which is the super powerful thing that lets us really be able to write a lot less code. We have to be working with things as a pointer or a reference type. With a value type, polymorphism, that process of when we go to run this function, it figuring out what the particular type of class is and running the correct bit of code, that 
does not happen if we use a value type. That's a really, really important thing to be aware of with this. Uh, now, because I did allocate a bunch of memory here, I'm going to uh, do the right thing and make sure I actually clean up the memory. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is just from a point of view of having the naming, uh, this is sort of a personal style one that I recommend, so just keeps it a little bit neater. So here, free the memory for the animals. And here we are, allocate and store a bunch of animals. So, okay, we've got a basic setup of inheritance going. We've layered in this concept of polymorphism, which makes our life so much easier. As I said, to add in a new animal, I create the class for it, and it's a single line. Really handy. So, okay, what if we wanted to go a step further? Because these, these functions are pretty much the same for each one. The only thing that changes is the name. So what would be handy is, okay, well, the animal class, I could set up so it actually stores the name on it. So there's a couple of ways I could go about doing this, but one of the ways would be if I bring in a string class, then I could say here, okay, well, let's have, and I'll make it initially public. And animal name is what that would let me do is I could then set that up for each of the individual animals. So having something like a constructor in this case, and I'm going to make it that it has to take in a name in name. We'll just set that up. So okay, it's able to take it'll be able to take in a name and it will properly set that up. Let's handle the case of okay, well, if we haven't provided a name, uh, then what I will do is just have it run the uh, constructor and set it to something like that. So, okay, that's pretty good. The actual animal class here could then say, hi, and we just put animal name. That would allow us to simplify the code a bunch. So if I decide, okay, well, fish, they don't need to customize this. So I'm going to comment out the ones for fish. So it doesn't have that function anymore. And we'll say maybe the birds also don't. So those functions don't exist anymore now for the bird or for the fish. So what do we get now if we output stuff? We should expect it not to be perfect because we've got cat and dog still working, but we have unknown name and unknown name. So how can the bird and the fish get that name populated in there? Well, what they can do is we could actually have a constructor for those. So we could be saying, okay, well, fish, and when that initializes, that runs the constructor for animal to say fish. So we can actually run the constructor of our parent class like that. We can do the exact same thing for the bird. We have bird. And what that will do is it runs the animal one. 
same as we did for the fish. So if I run it with that now, then we can see bird, cat, dog, fish, all of those appear. So this is demonstrating a couple of really handy things. One is that, okay, if the function, if the logic of it is exactly the same in the child classes, then we can just put a version of it in the parent. So we're writing even less code again. So that means to add in a new animal, I have very, very little code that I need to write. But what if we wanted to do something different? So we do have the bird and the fish intentionally you know, not implementing that and not providing their own custom version. But what if we want to use a mix? What if we want to use part of the parent and also have part of the child logic run there? Well, we can do that. So in the case of the dog and the cat, well, let's run the parent one. So one way that I can do this is I can just go, okay, well, animal, perform a peer. And then I'm going to output a custom message. So this is, in this case, we're running the parent code, and then we're doing our own additional stuff layered on top of it. Again, this is the advantage with inheritance. We can choose to have all of the common logic in the parent and run that common logic, or we can do where we completely override that and substitute our own version in the child class, or we can do a mix of both. We can use some of the parent logic, and we can also then add in our own logic at different times. So we can output a custom message like that. Now, in this case, we are doing this. It should be ML. We're doing this, we're running the parent logic beforehand. We could do the opposite for the cat one. So what I could do is output here. And I am intentionally making sure that I say both cats and dogs are cool, because uh, I don't want to <laughs> cause any arguments uh, about which ones are better. They're both awesome. I'm just unfortunately allergic to most cats. Uh, cool. So we should see some different stuff happen here. For the cat, it's going to output its own little bit of stuff and then run the parent logic. And then for the dog, it will do the opposite. So it gives us a good illustration of kinds of ways that we can be working with this. So if I run this, now we see I'm an unknown name, I'm an unknown name. That's because we need to make sure, because we're running that base version, we have to make sure that we set up our constructor that populates the particular bit of information. So just an important thing to make sure we don't forget that. Got our logic in there. So now if we run it, you can see cat's cool, outputs the message in introducing itself, or then the dog, and outputs that. So we've customized the logic. So we're seeing a few different ways of working with this. One where we you know, completely change the logic, and others where we go and, and just using the uh, parent logic there, which is really handy. So this is one of the big advantages with inheritance. It makes it a lot simpler for adding in particular things. Uh, so if I wanted to add in now a new animal, uh, so let's add in a rabbit. Rabbits are also cool. Now I could have indicated that the base class was an animal at that point, but all I'm going to do is include animal h and then I would set up here all I would need to do uh, for the constructor is just rabbit an animal 
we just say that it's a rabbit. So if I did no more than that, I could then easily go here and, okay, well, all animals, I'm going to add in a new rabbit. And I'll have to add in, obviously, the include for it. So we've added that in for being able to add in the rabbit, the one thing we missed and why it's giving an error there is we just need to make sure it is public. So easy thing to forget, you might get a scenario where you, if you have that, where it's saying it's inaccessible, often it's going to be a case that the inheritance there wasn't set to public. But if I run this, then I've added in a rabbit. So it makes it very quick for us being able to add in new things. And one of the nice things with inheritance is, as I said, the data that we have on the parent, we can access that on the child. So for example, if I went to something like the dog, then I could actually access that variable that is here on the parent. So in dog, I could be saying, I'm an animal of type animal name. So because that variable is on the parent, uh, I can actually access it in any of the child classes. So this makes it really easy for if we have a lot of common data, we just can put that on the parent class. Now, an important thing with this is we don't necessarily want this to be accessible outside of it. Because at the moment, I would be able to here, if I expand this out, I would be able to do something like this, where, okay, well, animal pointer, animal name is, and I could just put in garbage. And then when it runs, it would actually output that. So I could be messing with that and that's not good. We don't want to do that. So we haven't really dived a lot into access levels, but when we start working with inheritance, they actually have a lot of meaning and are quite important. So public makes everything accessible. There's two other common access levels that we use. Uh, so one of them is protected. So what protected means is protected variables and functions are visible within the owning class and its children. They are not visible outside of that. So if we want data or we want functions that only the parent can access, or only the child classes can access, then we can mark them as protected. That, if I tried to then do that same line from before, I now can't. So this is something that is quite important with inheritance, is we do want to start making use of things like protected, where we can actually make stuff so that it's only visible within that parent class within the child classes so that we're making our code safer essentially. Now we might have data that we don't want even the child classes to be able to see, in which case we can mark it as private. So private variables and functions are only visible within the owning class. Now, C++ does give us a few ways around that, and that is something that uh, we will look at at a separate point in time, but that is something that to be aware of is we do have a couple of tricks that we can use to actually change that, but they're ones that we want to be cautious with when we use them, because data has been made private or protected for a good reason generally. So this is a, uh, just going to call this invisible to children. 
And I'll actually find if I try and access that. So whereas with dog, we can access animal name. I tried to output that. It'll let me write it, it'll auto complete it. But we can see, can't actually run it, can't find it. So that's actually really handy. So we can have data there in our parent class that everything can see, thing, including things outside of the classes. Uh, we can have data that only that class and the children can see, which is really great for internal things like names, really great for uh, helper functions, things like of that too. And we can also have data that is fully hidden. Uh, that's in particular useful if we've got stuff that might be running on the parent class where it's not safe for the child class to actually be directly accessing that. We can mark it as private and then it's not going to be uh, accessible there. Okay, so let's just recap what we've looked at because we've looked at quite a few things. And let's then talk a little bit about how do we decide where to use inheritance? How do we decide what data, what, inf what functions to put where? So a couple of key things with inheritance and the aspect of polymorphism that we're using here. The goal with inheritance is to let us write less code. It's to allow us to focus our efforts when we're adding new things in on that new thing, not on going on maintaining older code. It allows us to keep our code simpler, and more generic, which allows us to, again, it's less chance of errors, so it future-proofs things a lot. And keeping that code simpler is generally always good. Simpler, shorter code, always better. So one of the main things that inheritance allows us to do is we can have a single, things like a single list or a function that can work on just our, you know, that particular base class, that parent class. And then we can run functions on that. And when we run that function, we can have a parent implementation that does something. We can also have uh, child versions of that that override it. So our child classes could run the parent version. They could substitute entirely their own version. They could do a, bit, a mix of both if they're wanting to. So it keeps that code simpler. However, for that aspect that we have of inheritance called polymorphism, where it figures out what actually am I running on, for that to happen, we have to have the data that we're working with as either a pointer or a reference. If we are working with value types, it will not do the, that polymorphic call. It simply won't happen. So we have to, that does mean we have to do a few more steps. We need to be mindful of the fact that we're allocating memory and we need to make sure we then free that memory afterwards. Otherwise we get memory leaks. So we can set things up to make it a bit more efficient for us in terms of how we go about setting things up. What I generally look for for deciding when I'm going to make use of inheritance is I look and see, okay, is there, what is common about these particular things? Do they share data? Do they share functionality? If they share data and if they share functionality, particularly if you've got that combo of both, inheritance is going to be a general sort of good approach there. And then we can start to think about, okay, well, what makes sense for grouping these things? You know, in the case of these with the different animals, well, okay, having a parent animal class makes sense. If we had something that was more complicated, we might end up with, okay, swimming animals, flying animals, walking animals. And then those might have an animal class that sits above them. Because inheritance isn't just a, okay, we have a parent and a child. Inheritance hierarchies can go pretty much as deep as you want them to. You'd want to try and avoid it going too, too overboard, but they can go very deep. So we could have animal that has stuff that is only common to every animal, has the functions, has the data that's common to all of them. Then we could have you know, our, our ground ones, we could have our swimming ones, our flying ones, and that would have common things to them. Because for example, you know, a, a bird 
is going to need to move slightly differently you know, to something that's on the ground. So having them have different aspects there would make sense. And then we could have bird inherit off of you know the flying animal. We could have bats. We could have different ones off of those uh, classes there, depending upon what's appropriate. And it always comes down to looking at where do we have common behavior? Where do we have common data? So then when we're setting that up, if we go to our parent class, we want to start thinking about, well, where do we want things to be accessible from? Data that, or, and, or functions, that it's not safe. And that's usually our criteria, where it's not safe or it potentially would be unsafe for child classes to directly access that. Those we should mark as private. If it's data that it's completely fine and makes sense for child classes to access it, but nothing uh, in, you know, outside of that should access it, then protected is what we should use. Otherwise, if it's things where it's safe for anything to access it, uh, then public is where we should be going. So using these different access levels is really important because those access levels indicate what we consider to be safe to actually access. If something is public, you are saying, yep, this is entirely safe for uh, anything outside of it to be reading from it, to be modifying it, to be calling that functionality. Same for if it's protected. You're saying it's completely safe for any child class to be changing that data. As soon as it's a case where it's not, it shouldn't then be protected or it shouldn't be public. So starting to get used to using these access levels is quite important. When we're setting up our children, one of the things we did need to make sure we did is we have to make sure it's saying it's inheriting publicly from animal. So I do want to dive separately in another video into access levels because it is quite a large topic in and of itself. Uh, so that we will look at it in more detail. But one of the big things we want to be aware of is generally public is going to be what you want to be doing. For it to be able to inherit from this, we also need to make sure we include the header file of that parent class so that it can do that inheritance then when we want to have a function that can be varied from the children, which we might not always do, like we could have functions here that we don't mark as virtual, which then means the child is not going to be able to sort of customize that behavior for it. That's okay. But when we do have common ones, we mark them as virtual in the parent, and then in the child, we mark them as virtual and override. Override is a newer uh, thing to the C++ language. And by indicating override there, if that function didn't exist in the parent, we would actually get an error. So if I did something here, like virtual void does not exist in parent, and we'll call that does not exist in parent one. And I'll actually just put the implementation of it here uh, just to illustrate the particular problem. Does not exist in parent two. But the difference is I will mark this one as override. And you'll notice immediately I get an error because it tells us that the thing doesn't exist. So I'd strongly recommend when you're overriding functions in a child class to make sure you do actually specifically put override. Just so you get that error, if something changes in the parent class, it lets us catch errors uh, much more readily, and that's really important. So in terms of where to go from here, what I would recommend is, firstly, as a starting point, add in another animal. Look at how the process goes there. Add in your own you know, customizations for perform appear. Do that as a starting point. As a next stage for practicing with this, what I would do is add in some other functions. Add in a function in the parent class that you don't actually customize in the child one and see how that works. Then add in a function that you do customize in the child classes and look at the different ways we can work with that. 
have it so that you, you know, run the parent, maybe you don't run the parent, try the different combinations there. So experiment with the different things that you can be setting up there. If you then want to take things a step further, add in that layer of classes I mentioned of ground-based ones, flying ones, water-based ones. Add in that layer and adjust this code so that now the dog is inheriting from ground animal, that the fish is inheriting from swimming animal, for example. So look at the different particular ways that you could be doing that and it, you know, experiment with that. That's a good way of setting up that inheritance hierarchy and getting a bit more familiar and, com and comfortable with using inheritance. Don't be afraid to dive in and be working with the code like that. It's going to, going to be the most effective way to actually sort of learn stuff. You can also then, as a final thing, set up an entirely different set of things. Maybe think of it from a point of view of different characters, you know, humanoid characters, sort of the archetypes you might see there. You could have a melee character, a ranged one. You could have ones where it's a, you know, a physical-based ranged one, where it's using you know, weaponry. You could have something where it's a magic-based ranged one. Look at setting up something completely different and build up those classes. See how that goes for it. Key thing is that diving in and experimenting. Thanks, folks. I hope you found the video interesting and helpful. Uh, if you have, check in a like and subscribe. It really helps out. It's really appreciated. Uh, if you are looking for the code for the project, there is a link to that in the description below. Uh, if you're trying to find other videos and similar topics, I do have a searchable video archive, which I've put a link to that as well in the description. So you can look for videos based upon their description, particular topics. Uh, there's also a lot of different groupings there that I've set up for them. If you have any questions, chuck in a comment below. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there's a link to that in the description below as well. But until next time, bye.